you know, we always have to be careful about the, you know, don't go down the Terminator path. Hello and welcome to The Nexus. This week we're looking at the rapid development of artificial intelligence. With the launch of ChatGPT, it's clear the technology is coming on fast. The online tool is great for research, but where does it end? As AI becomes more powerful, will it end up taking all our jobs, even mine? Or worse still, might AI actually become sentient and decide to eliminate us altogether? It sounds like some nightmarish sci-fi movie, but then again, some very serious people are warning it might just happen. I am Assistant, a large language model trained by OpenAI. I am not a person, but a program designed to assist with answering questions and providing information on a wide range of topics. Is there anything I can help you with today? Yes. Are you going to take my job? Oh, no response. The ChatGPT server is down overloaded by millions of people making billions of requests to do all types of tasks, like writing their CVs or essays, or writing a computer program for them, or predicting the outcome of football matches and racing events, and even the lottery, which is beyond its capabilities, at least for now. But it's still the smartest AI chatbot available to the public in the world, and in just five days after its November 30th launch, it had a million users. Its wild success means ChatGPT's owner, OpenAI, which is led by Sam Altman, is now worth billions. In six weeks, these guys have gone from zero in valuation to now being a $29 billion company, okay. give or take, Okay. in six weeks. Its massive valuation reflects ChatGPT's versatility. It can do more than just chat. Write a 1,000 word paper on the Iranian revolution in Donald Trump's voice. Okay. It wrote the paper. Sure. I said, write a hip hop song by Tupac on the subject of this, if Tupac was alive today, it wrote the, okay. the song. It's extremely powerful. It's obviously powerful. And when something is super powerful and super convenient, humans will use it. And if the Terminator is anything to go by, AI will eventually connect to the internet, overthrow humans, and then, well, terminate them. Could ChatGPT do that? I do not have the ability to browse the internet, so my responses are based solely on the information that I was trained on. Well, that's a relief. Artificial intelligence might not take over the world, but it might take over your job. There is a, a computer engineer who purported to work for Tesla, he asked GPT, chat GPT, he said, look, I work for Elon Musk, but I haven't been doing much for the last week, so I need you to write me 10 bullet points about what I probably would have done as a, as a engineer at Twitter. What 10 things did I do last week that were productive and valuable? And oh, if you don't mind, write me the accompanying computer code that goes with each project. And it did that too, three seconds, and the computer code works. Well, joining me now to discuss the future of AI in our lives are Inmar Martinez, who is an AI pioneer and a consultant to a number of governments and international bodies. And we also have Ross Dawson, who is a futurist and author. Uh, welcome to both of you. Inmar, if I may start with you, uh, this is considered to be the most powerful AI program uh, now available to the public. Is that correct? And what makes it so powerful? Well, the, the emphasis is available to the public. It's not the only one, it's not the only uh, assistant that has been trained to understand what people are asking it and able to, you know, just go through thousands of documents. It's only that this, the, this is the first one that has been put in the hands of uh, common people to play with it and to use it. But it's not the only one. Makes me curious about who has more powerful AI programs out there. Can you tell us that? So uh, very, very large uh, technology companies such as Alphabet, Google, uh, um, even Meta, you know, they have also developed this type of uh, AI assistance. Um, it's only that uh, Alphabet, Google has been very careful uh, not to put in the market the ones that they're developing. They're developing two, one for Google Chrome for all the searches called Lambda, and another one is being developed by British company DeepMind which is called Sparrow. Okay. So uh, developing, uh, you know, dialogue AI is something that has been done for a very long time. 
Okay, now that uh, we ordinary public have access to it, how should we use it? What's the best way? The best way is to uh, use it to fetch information. It's a, it's a way in which if you want to ask ChatGPT about you know, a specific topic, it will search through the thousands and thousands of texts in its library, and then you can ask it to bring it to you in whichever form you want. If you're having a conversation, it would look like a dialogue. You could also ask, write me an essay of 2,000 words on this topic, and it will just do precisely that. And funny enough, people have been asking ChatGPT to write even in the style of the King James Bible. So we know that ChatGPT is very well versed in all kinds of literary I, styles. Yeah, yeah. I think that might have been uh, Jordan Peterson who said, you know, we all, all, all ought to be rather afraid of this uh, development and that within a couple of years time, uh, it'll not just be smarter than us, it'll actually be able to engage with the real world like a scientist, not like a humanities uh, teacher, but like a scientist. Ross Dawson, uh, do you think it's something we ought to be a bit scared of? Well, there are certainly some reasons for concern, though I think uh, what uh, you've just uh, stated is a little overblown on a number of fronts. One, one aspect is that they are good at language. So as, uh, as we heard from Inma, this is around predictive language models and based on the amount of text out there, it can predict and give a confident answer and uh, give us some text which is very legible, which is very friendly, but that does not give it the ability to act in the physical world. That is a completely different dimension, which is in the large language models we are talking about. So the critical thing to understand is that intelligence has many dimensions, and there are many aspects where computers have exceeded human capabilities a long time ago. And chess is one of the most famous ones, Go more recently, uh, image recognition, there's a whole variety of things. But I believe that there are many domains where human intelligence will exceed that of the uh, machines for the indefinite future. So we need to design work, we need to design organizations, we need to design a society where we can accentuate and to draw out and to develop the unique capabilities of humans that can be complemented by machines. So there are concerns, but these issues of being transcended by machines and anything that like the foreseeable future, I think, are far overblown. I'll probably come back to that in a second. But Inma, before we do that, um, these, sorry, the, the, the AI program, Chat GPT, it's been programmed to make sure that it is accurate and that it uh, is not biased and so on. But it's learning with the supervision, if you like, of human beings who are inherently biased. So is it possible really to create such a perfect, I ideal AI program? No, and thanks for the question, because uh, ChatGPT has severe limitations, which is why Alphabet and Meta have not, you know, really fully released theirs. Meta did, but it took it off the market in three days because people were trolling it and it began to be incredibly biased. So it has severe limitations. And the mistake is that people think that it's intelligent as in having emotions and an understanding of life and the universe, but it is not. It's like a little Alexa for texts and conversations with humans. So okay. for example, in France, uh, ChatGPT was asked to take the uh, baccalaureate exam uh, for philosophy and it, and it failed. It doesn't understand philosophy. It's just a text processing system. Hmm. But we do have people like Elon Musk saying that uh, ChatGPT is scary good. We are not far from dangerously strong AI. What, how do you interpret that warning then? Uh, uh, Elon Musk is an original investor in uh, OpenAI, which is the developer of ChatGPT. I would not trust that with the barge pole. Okay. Um, <laughs> quick question about that. He did uh, make uh, an acknowledgement that ChatGPT had been uh, I interfacing with Twitter, with the Twitter database, and that as soon as he found out about that, he put a stop to it. Can you explain anything about that? Yeah, well, it's because uh, ChatGPT uh, sometimes uh, is very easy to, mis to mislead and he wouldn't want to jeopardize the very good work that OpenAI CEO is doing trying to raise such uh, OpenAI valuation. It's, I... it's, the language model has serious mistakes. It's been failing to some people that have been testing it. So that's a reality that they have to face. Can I ask what access to... Yeah, come in, come in, Ross. Yeah. 
I was just going to say one of the key points here, and as uh, Inmer has been saying, is that there are risks to very large organizations in terms of reputation, amongst other things, So, which is why Google and Meta have been uh, averse. We, we should also should not forget the Chinese, such as Baidu, which are very advanced in their language. But yeah. OpenAI is playing a little bit faster and loose. It's not accurate. It's not fair to say that it's accurate models. It's not say, fair to say it's unbiased. It's put in some safeguards where basically it doesn't say anything if it thinks there's a risk of being biased. And in the case of Twitter, essentially Elon Musk feels that it's giving it data which is feeding and developing the value of that, that machine. So this is where those who are more adventurous, uh, such as OpenAI or also stable diffusion in the image space, are experimenting with new, more open models, which does contain more risks to these situations. But the reality is that there will always be these players which are less constrained by being large public companies and are thus pushing the boundaries and you know, potentially introducing some technologies that, for example, can be abused by bad actors. In Mark, a quick yeah. couple of questions. Uh, Sam Altman, the CEO and co-founder of OpenAI, which owns ChatGPT, well, he's predicted we could get to real AGI, artificial general intelligence, in the next decade, and we have to take the risk of that extremely seriously. First of all, would that be a big leap? What does artificial general intelligence mean compared to what we have now? Um, it basically is a machine that develops a conscious, a conscience about its own existence, and therefore its intelligence is much beyond uh, human uh, human thinking, human thought, human cognition. And the fear is that such an intelligence will destroy us and, and probably uh, take rogue movements in the world. I disagree with, uh, with Sam uh, because the AI industry, which is where I live and I develop, uh, we know that we're really, really far away from a potential super intelligence. Um, why, would but, someone, why would someone in the industry, though, make such a warning, give such a warning? Because it's a typical Silicon Valley attitude. I remember when Singularity, about 10, 15 years ago, said exactly the same thing, and then they had to backtrack. So well, does, it, does, it also just, give, does it also give justification to his own business? Exactly. That's okay. why this is a CEO that is raising a valuation of a company. Whatever comes out of his mouth, you have to take it very carefully. Well, that valuation is put at, uh, by some, $29 billion in Mar. What yeah. makes uh, OpenAI worth such a, an enormous sum? Nothing. It's just market speculation. It's incredibly emotional, this type of valuations that uh, some of the companies in the U.S. receive. We see what's happening to Tesla right now is coming down hugely to some common normal levels. Okay, well, we've run out of time. Inma Martinez and Ross Dawson, thank you both very much for your expertise today. Much appreciated. We've heard from our two experts here on the future of AI and what it might bring, but what does the general public think? We sent our producer, Salah Hadin, down to central London once again to find out. Fear artificial intelligence will take your job. I hope so. You hope, you hope so? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's it. That's might mean I get redundant then, get, get a payoff and go and retire. So you're not fearing that perhaps there's going to be... Um, there's going to be mass unemployment due to machines taking over people's work? No, I think there'll be other, other, other jobs and stuff created, I think. So I think um, people will lose jobs, but then there'll be other stuff made available. It's helping us to develop the world. Develop the world. So you're not afraid that artificial intelligence in the future perhaps might take your job? Oh, yeah, it might. It might? <laughs> yeah, it might, might do. But anyway. How would you, what would you do in that situation? Um, then we should destroy it. Whatever job you do in the future, do you fear that artificial intelligence might take that job? It's taking like loads of jobs, like office jobs, like Amazon Fresh, stuff like that. Like it's just it's take, it's reducing jobs. It's a good initiative in terms of um, probably making things faster, making things more efficient, but it's definitely um, a negative for human beings who obviously need jobs, especially um, in an economy, in a world economy that's getting worse. Well, is your job safe? Let's consult a couple of experts. Joining me now are Mike Ryder, who researches robotics, AI, and ethics at Lancaster University, and Ivana Bartoletti, who is the co-founder of the Women Leading in AI Network. Uh, welcome to both of you. Um, Ivana, if I could start with you. We've had various different scenarios put to us by our viewers. 
and they would like to know if their jobs are safe and how they should proceed in the future. Here's one. Uh, this is a, a young lady who's studying for her IB uh, finals, and uh, she is preparing to apply to university. Which, uh, co which course should I be looking at, she asks. Which careers are going to thrive in the age of AI, and which are most likely to become obsolete because AI can do them better? What do you think? It's a really interesting question, and I think uh, the younger generation choosing the future now have got um, sort of some important choices to make, but also some great opportunities ahead of them. The first thing that I would say is that artificial intelligence is much more than a technology. It's much more than a technology because it's reshaping the way that we will do things. So yes, it will require technical skills. So we will require people who know how to do all this. But my bet is that the future will be shaped by what we will do with this technology rather than the, by the technology itself. What I mean by this is that we will need a lot of skills, a lot of skills around how we work with these machines, how we govern these machines, how they will interact with us. Um, machines like ChatGP3 that I'm sure that a lot of people are talking about at the moment, they are machines. They do, you know, they do not experience things. They are um, machines that we train with data. They do not live or feel anything. They are machines that can support us. So what is important for the generation is to understand what artificial intelligence is, what these machines that are supposed to take over our jobs actually are, and really um, imagine that um, the, the, the space for humanity, the space for experience, the space for feeling the moment and, and, and life, that belongs to us as humans. And machines can add a component to it and enrich it and make mm. it better if we are able to regulate it and to, to give it, get, get it right. But uh, there is no one area that is important in the age of AI. It's not that everything will be done by machines. So whether it's the law, okay. whether it's medicine, okay. whether it's, it's how we do this with the support and, and help of, of the machines. Mike, do you think that uh, our inherent humanness has such value that uh, AI programs won't be able to replace us? Well, I think the hope is that that's, that's the case, certainly. Um, my colleague made some really good points just then. I think at this stage, it's really useful to consider the fact that we haven't got to a point yet where we've got a what we might call a general intelligence AI. And so it's really important to understand what AI currently is not and the difference between AI and perhaps human ways of thinking. So an AI is very, might be very good at calculations. It's the humans where in sort of creativity come, comes into, into play, something that machines currently cannot do. So perhaps creative jobs are the ones that might last in the age of AI, whereas, say, coding, which everyone was getting so excited about, maybe there's going to be the problem. I mean, there's that, I don't know if it's an apocryphal tale, of, of a Twitter employee uh, asking a chat GPT to write code for it so that it could, it could look, like it's been, it look like he's been doing his job. And it did it. A chat GPT did it very, very quickly. Um, Ivana, isn't that an example of where people could be supplanted by AI? I mean, there are areas where definitely um, th there is a, um, a great use of these tools. No? So, for example, take customer services, for example, um, where um, they, they, it's a very important area because we need to have a good experience. So if you, go, if you, you use online chatbot where for customer support, that is an area where definitely ChatGP3 can be used much more. Um, you can ask ChatGP3 about anything, can you? You know, you can ask him to write you a poem. You can write to so, but it's 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 simply something that doesn't come from you from from uh, from the experience that ChatGPT Ch is living. Um, but it simply comes from a, a program which has been ingested and fed a lot of data. Um, so there will be definitely use. Um, just, um, for example, um, some of yeah. I was going to say not just customer services though. I mean, we're hearing about a uh, unprecedented court case coming up on uh, February the 22nd. Uh, Do Not Pay AI is uh, venturing that it will be the first time uh, in court that a robot lawyer is uh, uh, permitted to defend uh, somebody. It's a speeding fine in this case. Um, we have you know, middle-aged solicitors asking us, do I need to retrain? How long have I got left in my job? What do you think? So it's a really interesting question. 
And that caused also a little bit of caution here, because alongside of these stories, we've also seen incredible stories about AI. We've seen AI, for example, because it's fed with data, that data is just a picture of our society. We've seen AI discriminating. We've seen AI, for example, discriminating um, women because um, in, in giving them more credit. We've seen discriminating against people of color, and, and this happens in facial recognition. Or we've seen something that happened in the Netherlands where a software will use to determine whether it's families were at risk of defrauding um, social security. And because that software was built in a way which wasn't that careful, it discriminated against people of colour, leading a lot of people into poverty and 1,000 on kids, kids being taken into care. Why am I saying this? Because we've got to be happy that these systems are there and can support us. And the robot judges, yes, I mean, that could be something that can help when it comes, for example, to fines or something on an admin level. But we have to be very careful as well that these systems are not perfect. They're not perfect now. They won't be perfect in 10 years. Do you know why? Okay. Because these systems are in society and they breed what society feed them. So it's really important that we take this into consideration. Mike, you teach at a university, so this is a particularly uh, good scenario to put to you. As a master's student is asking this, and I'm halfway through my master's dissertation. It's been a real slog. What's to stop students in the future from just asking ChatGPT to write it for them? Well, this is a really good question and one I've been having colleagues over the last few weeks, actually. Um, it's strange to think that this has been creeping on, up on us quite slowly, but now it, it, it's a very real possibility. Ivana, is regulation required? Are you trying to push for regulation in that regard? I think GP 3 more than other things, is showing that, you know, that regulation is needed. Um, I mean, things like GP 3 have existed for a long time, as AI has existed for a long time. What is the difference? That was the huge amount of data and the huge amount of computation power that are used, and they're escalating things and making it bigger and make it available to a lot of people. But regulation is needed because if we want to make the most of this, we've got to also deal with the consequences and we and, and potential risks if we really want to, to, to really embrace these technologies. For example, there is a campaign that we've just launched called Audrey, which talks about how we really um, leverage th these technologies for the good and how we can uh, place some controls around them, which is not to stop the technology, but it's really to make sure that we are able to make the most of them without running any risks. And on the school thing, I just wanted to say one thing, if possible. I think students need to be taught about these tools and they need to be taught how to make the most of them because it's, it's, there is no, I mean, there's no other way. These tools will be there and they can be really useful and really teaching the students how to use them, where is what they really are and demystifying this because the media have also huge responsibilities and too much of the time they, AI has been taught as like AI is like Terminator. Um, AI is either very good or is either very bad. So the schools have the responsibility to really teach the students what this is, that this really is, to demystify okay. it, to Mike, use it, to make the most of it. Just one final question really quickly. OpenAI, uh, Meta and Google, they're all looking to build an AI model capable of generating video. Um, could that all go very, very wrong? I mean, you know, it makes movies, sure. But what if it makes, starts making propaganda? Well, yeah, this is the big problem, isn't it? Um, deep fakes. I mean, we've already seen this in social media, sort of, um, sort of fake versions of, sort of presidents, for example. And I mean, really, this is just building on the issues we already have with social media. People are reading, believing the things that they read online as if they're the truth. They're not being able to tell the difference between truth and lies, what's authentic and what's not. And this is really taking it to the next level when you have the possibility that people may be faking videos of myself, yourself and um, all of our listeners here, um, it, it's going to prove a great challenge to us going forward, certainly. Ivana, what's going to happen if people can't even believe their own eyes? What's going to happen to society? Well, I think it's really important that, uh, that uh, first of all, we, we educate the public about what, what we're talking about. It's really important that people um, are being told when something is produced by a machine and something is not produced by a machine. It's really important that we understand how to use the systems, how to not use them. Um, what are the issues, for example, around um, massive um, uh, uh, development? So, for example, take deep fakes. They use the deep fakes maybe playing in a court of law. Um, the use of disinformation and how this can. And I think there are 
things happening all over the world at the moment, from China um, to the United States, to really try and, and put some controls around all this. OpenAI has admitted it clearly that these tools are risky. So it's not the companies are walking into this without thinking. And I think it, we are seeing GPT-3, but um, there are talks that we will be seeing GPT-4 in the next few months. And that, that will be really mind-blowing. So we need to, I think we have a crucial moment um, to really regulate and, and govern right. the intersection, the relationship between humanity and technology. I mean, the moment is really now. Mike Ryder and Ivana Bartoletti, thank you so much, both of you, for your contributions to The Nexus today. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, if you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week, then. Goodbye.